Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure you need any introduction. No. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you all read the newspaper, you'd know a lot more about Tom than before. <laughs> but it's a real pleasure to have you here, and it's a and it's really nice to we've done so much work on the forested landscape, and um, now it's nice to look at the the granite that we've got across mm -hmm. the river. We're probably on granite here. I'm expecting it. Well, I don't know. So, I don't think. What do you think, Roger? Probably not granite over here. Do you think? Mm -hmm. There is some little bits of granite. If you look on that big road cut, uh -huh. uh, there's a few infiltrations of granite into the surrounding schist. Huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, All thank right. you. All right. So what we'll do is we'll spend about an hour um, inside looking at uh, slides of granite domes, which are, are landscapes that um, I find very compelling. And I remember. Um, after reading The Forested Landscape came out, my publisher said, oh boy, we'd love you to do a whole series of these books for the different forests throughout the United States. So one for the Southeastern Forest, you know, the Rocky Mountains, uh, Sierra Nevada, Pacific Northwest. And I, and I said, you know, I, I really wouldn't be that interested in doing that. It'd be somewhat repetitive. Um, so I, I, I'd like to do something else. And they said, well, do you have any other ideas? And I said, yes, I'd love to write this book on uh, glaciated granite domes. And I remember we were out to lunch, and I just got this blank look on their faces, like, what? <laughs> you know, and I just said, well, you know, I, I find them really compelling, and I'm always drawn to them. And, uh, you know, two of our uh, national parks that get the most visitation uh, are granite landscapes. That's Acadia and Yosemite. And I say, I think people go to these places because of these beautiful expanses of exposed glaciated granite. Um, and that not only that, Although the, the ecosystems that develop on them are not necessarily species rich, they're not, you know, lots and lots of species there because they're pretty austere places to grow on, um, the species that do grow there have very intriguing stories to tell. Um, so I convinced them and so we got to, to write this book called the, the Granite Landscape. So in the slide program we'll look at granite, um, some of its properties, why it naturally weathers into dome-shaped mountains. Um, we'll look at um, succession of uh, ecosystems on granite, spending a good amount of time on lichens and some of their characteristics. Um, we'll look at the disturbance regimes that occur on granite that often keep these things exposed. Um, and then after going through that overview, we'll, we'll be prepared to go out in the field and look at these features, which you can see right here in Black Mountain. Um, so if you have any questions while we're going through it, uh, please ask. and. Uh, I, don't, I haven't done this program in long enough. I can't remember if I have questions for you or not. So we'll see when we get there. But in any case, I guess we'll get right to it. And I'm going to, I think, be right here. I don't think I'll be blocking you. Can Roger, you, Roger, you can see all right? Yeah. Okay. So this is a slide of um, some White Mountain, Conway White Mountain granite. And granite is derived from the Latin granum which means grain, because granite is a, a, a coarse-grained igneous rock. What that means is it's a rock that cooled from molten magma pretty deep under the Earth's surface so that the cooling was slow, slow enough to develop large crystals. Now, granite's comprised of three major crystals. The most common one is quartz, which, you know, takes up about something like, um, you know, two-thirds to maybe three-quarters of the rock, and in this case, the quartz is a, a milky quartz. This is white, you know, crystal right here. Um, the second most common crystal, crystal are feldspars, and these are what give the granite its color. Um, so in this case, the, the feldspar here is a, like a, a, bit, a bit of a, you know, sort of a light pinkish color. And that, you know, usually drives about 20, 25% of the granite. And then the last remaining and least common uh, mineral are iron-containing minerals like black mica, or biotite, which we have here, or sometimes hornblende. Um, and again, they make up about 5 to 10% of the granite. Now, I should mention, the quartz and the feldspar are very hard minerals. And it's what makes granite such a hard rock, you know, the rock of ages, because it's very erosion resistant. But at the same time, it's a very brittle rock, making it easy to quarry. And um, we are going to visit an old quarry up on uh, Black Mountain that was at least worked in the very early 1800s, because we can tell the type of chisels that were used um, were before uh, star-nosed chisels and, and feathers and wedges that come in um, later on. Uh, yeah. Now, 
I, I don't understand how they do this, but, but people that are, that, that are really good at quarrying, they can look at granite and they can know if it's going to quarry well or, or not well. And I don't know how they do that. I don't, Roger, do you have any idea? But they can do this. They can tell if they're getting into areas of granite that just are not going to break cleanly or whatever. And yet, when I look at it, I can't see any difference in the quality of the rock at all. So this is um, <clears throat> a sample of granite from Yosemite National Park. It's a white granite because it has this, the uh, Milky Quartz, a white feldspar. And in this case, now it has hornblende um, crystals, again, an iron-containing mineral uh, as opposed to the black mica, which is uh, often more common out in these, these parts. Now, the reason that uh, granite weathers into domes naturally is that it, was, it formed deep under the Earth's surface, often many, many miles down. There's incredible pressure on top of that granite. And so as the overlying what's called country rock, that's the rock that the granite formed within, as that erodes away, there's this dramatic pressure release and the granite starts expanding and developing what are called expansion joints. And these can be both, you know, vertical and a cross-hatch pattern like that, but they also can happen in the granite itself, and they often take on a curvilinear sort of arrangement. So you can almost think of, um, if you took a granite dome and you slit down through the middle of it, it'd almost like be cutting down through an onion, where you'd see these curved layers of granite separated by expansion joints, and of course, in the center, they're going to be much thicker because there's still a lot more pressure on that rock. Then as you move this to the surface, we get less and less pressure and more and more expansion and more of those expansion joints. So what happens is when these things develop, as water gets down those expansion joints, um, maybe freeze and thaws, those things are shed, but the layers are shed in these curvilinear fashion, maintaining that sort of uh, dome shape. So here we can see some of these layers separated by expansion joints. So each of these ledges here separated by an expansion joint. And if you step back from something like this, like on half dome, now you can see those expansion joints really take on this curved process. So you can see how those, they're curving right up and around. And you'll see that the, uh, the, the layers between <coughs> the expansion joints up here are much thinner than as you move down the rock and they get much, much, much greater. Yeah. Yeah, so the granite, mo well, yes, but it, it's due to subduction events. So we can get volcanic activity that, that is happening like in the Hawaiian Islands. You're not going to get granites there because you have the magma coming up there is, um, uh, it's, it's a very basaltic magma, which means it's, it's very fluid and not viscous and it doesn't have a lot of moisture in it. So that just comes up in these huge black lava flows that just roll across the, the landscape. The, the, the magmas that make uh, granite are rhyolitic magmas. They have a lot of silica in them. They're much more viscous, and they have a lot of water associated with them. So if that sort of magma surfaces, it's going to be explosive, like on Mount St. Helens. But the way this, this material develops is by subduction. You get, when you get two continental plates colliding, you know, uh, often what happens is one plate gets subducted down underneath the other one, and it's dragging down all sorts of material with it. Um, and that material, when it goes down underground, you know, 40, 50, 60 miles, will melt under the heat and pressure, and it starts moving back up. And if it doesn't surface in a volcanic eruption, and it's this rhyolitic magma, it's going to form granite. And so the same processes that have formed granites in, let's say, New England, we're also doing that out west at different times, but the same sort of process. Now, in this case, um, this is another view of half dome. And the reason it looks the way it does is that originally it was overridden by glacial ice. Whenever glacial ice ro rides over a granite mountain, it's going to maintain that dome shape because as basically the glacier weathers off rock, it's going to weather it off along those expansion joints. But then at some phase, when we didn't have the glacial ice over the top here, but we had a valley glacier down in here, um, what valley glaciers will do, if, or even um, mountain glaciers that don't cover the summit of a mountain, they gnaw away at the mountain, making very dramatic relief. And in this case, at some point, undercut this thing, which then, you know, probably fell away in, in a fairly dramatic event. 
So the key is if glacial ice overrides a mountain of granite, it's going to maintain that dome shape. If it doesn't, it's going to create very dramatic uh, mountains with steep spires and horns and knife edge ridges and arets and things such as that as it scours away at the sides of the mountain. So here's an example of the, the different types. So this, this is in the Wind Rivers, which have our, uh, the highest elevation of granite domes in North America. The dome here is getting up to about the summit of it. It's getting up to about 11,500 feet, meaning the glacial ice in this area was at least that high up. Yeah. So what part of the United States is the Wind River? They're in Wyoming. Okay. So um, just sort of to the southwest of um, Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. But back here, we have Steeple Mountain, which rises to <clears throat> 13,700 feet. The glacial ice did not get over that, but carved away at the sides of it, making these very steep arets or knife edge ridges, these dramatic jagged horns. And uh, if you're a mountaineer or rock climber, this is the sort of thing you're going to want to be on. As for me, I, I'd rather be on this, where I often <laughs> will just take a nice siesta because Believe it or not, I find lying down on granite to be one of the best places to take a nap because uh, you can often find this very smooth granite that you might find a glacial groove in that just perfectly nestles your body. And all you need is like a nice, you know, jacket for a pillow. And there's no dirt or sand or leaf litter that's going to go down your neck or tickle you. There's no ants that are going to crawl on you or things like that. So I've often found my best uh, naps to be right on this hard bedrock, even though that sounds ironic. Um, now, this is a, an example of a knife edge ridge, and I better focus this a bit, or an arete. And this is on Snowmass Mountain in Colorado, again, a granite mountain. But what we had was we had a, uh, a mountain glacier over here in a cirque, a mountain glacier over here in a cirque. The ice did not get high enough to override the system, so they're both cutting into it, creating this dramatic, sinuous knife edge ridge. So again, if you know the glacial ice does not override the granite, you get these very, very dramatic features. Uh, this is another combination of glacial dome top and uh, horn and arete system in the uh, Stewart Range in the North Cascades in Washington. Uh, the domes here, the tops are around 7,000 feet. Prusik Peak here is going up to about um, almost 9,000 feet. And again, they're both granite, but looking very, very different because this was overridden by glacial ice which maintained the dome shape. This was cut away at the sides, making these very dramatic features. Um, I better get this in focus, too. Actually, you could do this for me. All you have to do is just turn this until it's sort of in focus, and then I don't have to keep running up and back. Um, and again, this is in Yosemite in California, where the dome tops are getting up around 10,500 feet, but then we get the cathedral spires uh, as horns and arets going up even higher. So this is a very common out west. In the east here, the only place where we can get something like this on granite is probably up at Mount Katahdin, where we do get, you know, arets and knife head edge ridges. If you've ever, you know, done that hike, you'd be familiar with that. Now, features that we can see left by the glaciers are features like this, and these are common anywhere you go. Um, this is what is called a roche mutane. It's a feature that you know, has this sort of gradual rise on this side and then a more dramatic face on this side. And the glacial ice would have been riding up this side, basically grinding down the surface of the granite, often scouring it, polishing it, uh, maybe putting striations on it. Um, and then this side got quarried, quarried away. And the way it's believed this works is you can see some of the expansion joints here, but we also probably had expansion joints maybe right in there going vertically up to the surface of the rock. And it's believed that as you know, glacial ice has to come over some promontory of bedrock, bedrock like this, there's a, a dramatic pressure increase at the bottom of the glacier that may melt the ice so it trickles down in those vertical crevices where now it can refreeze, grab onto this granite, and quarry it off. So if you look at the summit of Mount Monadnock, you know, from either the west or the east, you can see the very summit goes up gradually on the north face and then has a much steeper quarried south face. So that's a Roche Moutonne. Another good one you can see around here is if you're over at the airport in Keene, looking down at Mount Caesar. Mount Caesar's a beautiful Roche Moutonne where you'll see the mountain, you know, gradually going up on the north side and then a very steep south facing side. Now, Roche Moutonne is defined as stone sheep. Obviously, that does not look like a sheep. Um, and, uh, but the reason it's called this 
when these features are being named, um, men particularly in Europe were still wearing white wigs. And if you think, and they were called mutanes, those wigs were called mutanes. So if you think about like looking at the white wig on George Washington, you're going to see that above the forehead, the wig is going up like this and then sloping back to the ponytail on the back. So that form, that going up and then sloping back, since they're called mutanes, they said, oh, it looks just like this, so a, a, a roche mutane, a stone one. Um, now, a big roche mutane we can see in Acadia National Park is the beehive. Um, this is the face that's been quarried off facing, you know, behind Sand Beach. But if you go up the top and you walk back on this side, you're going to go down a ramp of much gentler granite that's been glacially scoured. Um, so these do occur, you know, wherever we can find glaciated granite. We're going to see these Roche Moutanes. Now, we can also get remnants of glacial polish. When the glacial ice was riding over the granite, at the base of it, there were all sorts of materials mixed into the granite. Uh, I mean, mixed in with the glacial ice. So there would have been boulders and, you know, gravel and sand and silt and clays. And so at the bottom of the ice, if you had these silts and clay on the bottom of the glacial ice, as that is being pushed over the granite, or any bedrock for that matter, and around here, the Laurentide ice sheet was probably, you know, moving about a meter a day. And when you think about having a mile of ice the pressure there pushing down the rock, being pushed over to a meter a day with those fine clays and silts underneath, well, they would polish this granite to have a surface not unlike maybe a granite countertop. Um, now, in places like Yosemite, where this picture was taken, where you don't have much lichen development because it's so dry during the growing season, you can still find large patches of this polish that are still intact. And if you get down and feel it, you'll feel it's just really smooth to the touch. Here in New England, where we have much more moisture, our lichens can etch the granite. So it's harder to find large expanses of glacial polish here in New England, but they can still be found. Um, and we'll find some up on, on Black Mountain as well. So this is more or less what the, the glacial polish would look like in a place like Acadia. Um, these are the polished surfaces here. And then in between, you have your lichen growth, which is actually pitted into the bedrock down about a third of an inch. So lichens uh, release weak carbonic acids, which slowly will chemically weather the rock. Now, how many people have heard that lichens create soil by chewing up rock like this? OK, it's, it's really sort of an ecological myth. Most of the material that is generated from bedrock like this to form soil often comes from mechanical means, you know, freeze and thaw cycles, expansion, contraction that breaks this rock up down almost into sand-like material. It's counterproductive for lichen to really erode the bedrock because that's what it clings on to. If it was going to you know, really erode it away, it would just blow away. So it's taken basically 13,000 years for this lichen to burrow down in the bedrock about of a third of an inch. So if we're going to wait for lichen to be forming soil, uh, we're going to wait a long time. Um, they, they do a little bit of that work, but uh, you know, their rates, again, of erosion are really quite, quite slow. But because of so much lichen growth here in New England, you know, often the biggest patches of polish we'll see might be about the size of a quarter. They're just not big expanses like you see out in Yosemite where there aren't many lichens. Now, another feature that we can commonly see on glaciated granite, we can see these definitely on Black Mountain as well, are these crescent-shaped gouges in the rock called crescentic gouges. And um, it's believed these are generated from boulders at the bottom of the glacial ice being tumbled in slow motion and being slammed into the bedrock. And of course, granite being very brittle, when one of these rocks hits the bedrock under all that pressure, it's going to flake out these crescent-shaped you know, um, pieces of rock you know, making these imprints. I mean, it almost looks like maybe an elephant walked there or something. Um, and you can get a, an estimate of the size of the boulder. If you take one of these crescents and you sort of you know, draw it out into a circle, that will give you an, an, an idea about the size of the boulder. And in this case, the boulder was being rolled um, up this way uh, so that that bow is always facing where the glacier is moving toward. Now, what you need to think about, glacial ice is not solid. That's why it can flow. Once um, glacial ice gets about uh, 200 feet or 60 meters thick, the weight becomes so heavy that the crystalline structure at the base of the ice collapses, and the ice turns from a solid into a plastic. 
And plastics are, th are things that look like solids, but they can flow. So silly putty is a plastic. So think about making a ball of silly putty, putting it on a table, leaving, coming back an hour later, it looks more like a puddle of silly putty because it's flowed out. Well, that's basically what glacial ice is. It's a plastic that can flow. So all the material within it is not locked into place. As the glacier is moving, it's all flowing, sort of in slow motion within the ice. You can almost think of like a, uh, a dryer that you've put in clothes in and some maybe tennis shoes that you washed, and the tennis shoes are going to tumble around, and they're going to hit each other every once in a while. Well, that's what's happening in the glacial ice. So this boulder is not just being dragged. It's sort of tumbling, and when it tumbles into the bedrock, flakes off these uh, crescentic gouges. Now, here's another feature that we can see uh, on these glaciated granite uh, substrates are glacial boulders. These are boulders that have been rounded because they were tumbled in the glacier. And of course, every time two boulders hit, you know, any prominences are going to be knocked off and they're going to be worn down into these boulders that are rounded. And actually, even huge chunks of bedrock after 100, 200 miles of traveling in a glacier will just be reduced down to sand and silt and clay because there's so much of this, this you know, sort of collision happening within there. What, how big is that? I know, how big is that? How, this one here, this is probably about eight feet high. Eight feet high. Where yeah. is that? This, here? Or? No, this is up in Acadia National Park. And you know, one thing you're gonna see is you know, incredible lichen growth because of all the, the, the fog and additional rainfall that comes in Acadia, you get really uh, luxuriant lichen growth. Now, if this, this rock here, you can see, is the pink Cadillac Mountain granite, the same granite it's sitting on. So this is just called a glacial boulder. But if this was a different type of rock, let's say this was a basalt boulder or something else, <clears throat> then it would be called a glacial erratic. Glacial erratics are glacial boulders that are different than the bedrock they sit on. And actually, this was, these, these glacial erratics were used as proof of things like Noah's Flood by uh, European scientists back in the 1700, early 1800s. They climb up on the mountain summits, and all of a sudden they see these big round boulders up there that are a completely different rock type than what they're sitting on. <coughs> and they know they had to be moved there from some other place because they couldn't have come from there because they're not the same type of rock. So the, the, the best explanation was Noah's Flood that was so dramatic, it just tumbled these things up there. Now, Louis Agassiz came along in the 1800s and he said, yes, you're correct, these were moved by water, but not water in the liquid state. These were moved by huge ice sheets, glacial ice sheets that carried them up there. And if he, he became sort of the father of uh, glacial theory, found evidence of large-scale continental glaciers in Europe, and then when he came over here to teach at Harvard, found the same thing here in New England. Um, and really, you know, people doubted him for a long time, but uh, he eventually has borne out that, yes, both Europe and areas in North America were once covered by huge ice sheets. Now, this is why I'm so enamored by these, these granite landscapes. This is uh, in Yosemite. Um, you know, all this glaciated granite with these glacial boulders all around it. And, you know, um, you can just stride right across this bedrock without having to watch your feet. I mean, it's like walking on a ballroom dance floor. And I see landscapes like this out west, and I'm just attracted to walk through them for miles. They just, there's something about this smooth expanse of bedrock that just draws me into it. And it almost looks like a surreal landscape, like I can almost like something by Salvador Dali with melting clocks on boulders or things. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, that's the beauty of it. Now, I should mention a place like this in Yosemite, very species poor. Not a lot can survive in that stuff, but there's something very elegant about these clean expanses of glaciated bedrock. Now, once glaciers depart, life is going to start colonizing these um, granite substrates. And if you think about it, this is going to be a very difficult place for plants to, to establish on. Um, there's three major features that plants are going to have to deal with. One is, where's the water? You know, where's the water on bedrock? That's going to be a problem. Two, how are you going to anchor yourself on a smooth sheet of basically uh, polished bedrock. And three, where are you going to get your nutrients? And really, the only um, group of plants, and they're not really plants, but the only photosynthetic entities that figure out how to do this are the crustose lichens. And so all of these 
things right here are crustose lichens. Now we have four different groups of lichens. We have the crustose lichens, the foliose lichens, the fruticose lichens, and the squamulose lichens. But pretty much on exposed glaciated granite, the only lichens that have been able to figure out how to grow in this very inhospitable environment are the crustose lichens. And they look like, crustose lichens look like they've been painted right on the rock. I mean, they're very difficult to remove. As a matter of fact, you'd need probably some sort of metal implement to scrape them off because they're so uh, adhered onto the rock. But they have three features that allow them to colonize the rock. The first thing is, for anchorage, they have thousands of, of microscopic fungal threads called rhizines that grow not right down between the mineral, mineral grains of the rock, but th into all these mi very minor sort of fractures in the mineral grains as well. And so these thousands of rhizines anchor them on the rock, so that's how they get anchorage. In terms of their nutrients, the bulk of their nutrients is coming out of the air or in water that, that's falling in the form of rain or running across the bedrock. Um, so their, their nutrients are taken care of in that way. And finally, like all lichens, their, their way to deal with lack of water is that the, all lichens are cryptobiotic. Crypt meaning hidden, biotic meaning life, meaning that when the moisture levels in their tissues drops to about 8%, uh, all of the enzymes and proteins start folding up in accordion-like fashion, and all chemical uh, reactivity in the lichen stops. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's no longer functional in any way, shape, or form. And that's what cryptobiosis is, that they just basically stop all chemistry. Now, they can hold that state for over a century. So you could take, um, you can take, you know, lichens in the cryptobiotic state, you could seal them away in a, a, a hermetically sealed vault. And for that period of time, they won't be doing any photosynthesis, no respiration, no chemical reactions at all. But take them out, douse them with water, they'll start swelling up, and within a few minutes, they'll be photosynthesizing and respiring and everything else. Now, so they make the definition of life very difficult because for them, they just turn on life and turn it off based on moisture levels. It's why they are, can be very slow growing. If they're in areas where water is limited, um, they grow very slowly. So that like in Yosemite, to get a green map like in which this is, this is a crustose lichen, the size of a dime in Yosemite takes 100 years, a century to grow the size of a dime. Because again, they only have moisture about 5% of the time during the growing season. So they're in this cryptobiotic state 95% of the time. Now to give you an idea how slow that rate is, getting up to uh, less than an inch in a century, well in that century, um, Yosemite, and in fact, all of North America due, due to continental drift will have moved almost eight feet. So the whole continent's gone eight feet almost, and they've only gone a little less than an inch. Um, so incredibly slow growth rates. Now, around here, it's going to take probably about 50 to 75 years to get this sort of lichen growth on exposed granite. Uh, in Yosemite, it would take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but around here about 50 to 75 years. Because of the lichens growing on the granite, they are now slightly altering the surface conditions. Um, there's now a thin veneer of nutrients on the surface there. There's a very thin rooting substrate on the surface, and these lichens can hold moisture on the surface for a slightly longer period of time. And just that slight alteration now allows the next group of plants to move in. Actually, they're not plants, it's another group of lichens but allows the next group of lichens to move in, creating this successional sequence um, on granite. And those are the foliose lichens, like this target lichen right here. Um, so here's all the crustose lichen, a lot of green map lichen out here. And foliose lichens are more robust. Um, they're only anchored in their centers. Their edges are not anchored on the bedrock. So that means they can now trap sort of sheet wash material and start building proto soils underneath them. Um, and they're often said to outcompete the, the crustose lichens. That's actually a misnomer. Um, these are predators. So what happens is this uh, target lichen expands out over the crustose lichens. It's going to consume them. That's why the band after where it's left is you can see the granite in there. They've denuded all the crustose lichen that was there. Um, by growing out. So they're actually predators. They, they colonize on top of crustose lichens, grow out over them, 
consume them in the process. So these lichens over here are getting really worried because, you know, <laughs> there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, and that thing's moving out over them. Um, yeah. So again, it's going to take 50 to 75 years before these folios lichens start to move in. And again, because they have much more biomass, they can create protosoils, um, they alter the conditions, which allows the next group of plants to move in, which is now the pincushion community. And this is really a very, very rare and unique community, uh, pretty much anywhere you can go. Um, in this case, these are pincushion mosses that are growing right on top now of the foliose lichen. So all this lichen in here now is foliose lichen. There's very little crustose lichen left on this chunk of granite. But this foliose lichen is getting so thick and having so much stored um, biomass in it that now these pincushion mosses can grow right on top of them. Now, we do have pincushion mosses around here. We can see them out in our woodlands, particularly like under hemlock forests where you see these, you know, nice pincushiony shapes. Um, but when you find them on bedrock, that's where you're looking at a really rare situation. They're very, very uncommon on bedrock. You know, to get a community like this, where these pincushions are probably only about three inches tall, you're looking now at an ecosystem that's been succeeding for about 200 years. I mean, in terms of our forests, this would be age-wise approaching old growth status. Now, the reason these are so rare, these pincushion communities, is they only occur in basically on, on granite bedrock that is pretty horizontal in its lie. You know, around here, if we get, let's say, you know, granite bedrock that's tipped like this, what's going to happen in the wintertime, we're going to build up a snowpack. The snow at the bottom of that snowpack is going to metamorph metamorphose into ice. And then in the spring, when water starts melting and lubricating the underside of that snowpack, it is going to start sliding down the granite, and it's going to take everything with it, except for pretty much the crustos lichens. So you need sites that are pretty horizontal for this to form on. Yeah. So, no, way in the back, I think there was a question. Um, is this is the same succession of lichens that you have on the barks of a tree on the bark of a tree. Well, it's going to be similar. You're going to start with crustose, and then go to folios, and then go to fruticos, uh, but different species, but the same sort of sequence, but different species. Yeah. You know the, the folios, it's it's live, it's eating the the. Uh, the first, the first set of lichen, as it expands and consumes it, does it leave a desert behind it, or does it? No. Does it, it, like in this case, this is this is a, a different species. This is not a target lichen, so it's just expanding out. I mean, it consumes all the crustos as it's going, but now its nutrients are pretty much just coming out of the air okay. or in rainwater. And Arthur, you had, you had something? <clears throat> not so much a question, but a comment, and that is, uh, I pointed out pincushion. Um, mosses to some youngsters ages about five to nine and you said they were, that community was rare. Well, pincushion seemed to be rare too because then I happened to ask, does anybody know what a pincushion is? <laughs> yeah. 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 Nobody yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Sort of like a typewriter. What's a typewriter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so having this very horizontal granite, granite is important. It also has to be in a place that is wind protected because these things are often very feebly anchored onto the rock and wind will blow them off. It also has to be in a place where animals or humans don't frequently walk because you know, footfall will knock these right off. And then um, finally, it has to be on bedrock like granite that does not have a lot of vertical fissures or expansion joints because as we're going to see, most bedrock is colonized by what are called crevice communities. And they form in these you know, crevices and then quickly sprawl out over the rock, often long before the pincushion community develops. So you're only going to find these, again, on relatively horizontal granite that's free of vertical expansion joints, that's wind protected, and where animals and people don't go. That's why they're so uncommon. So if you're ever out on granite, and you encounter something like this, you're seeing something really rare and also something quite, quite old. And um, you need to be very careful about how you would move across a landscape like that because it really deserves a lot of respect because of, you know, the length of time it's taken to develop. Is it soft like moss? It is soft like moss, yep. So is it, does it grow in the woods the same way? 
Well, it, they do, but they're completely different species. So you, we'll, see, we'll see today some, just the starting of pincushion communities up on Black Mountain, and then we'll see other pincushion communities in the woodlands that are, that are not uncommon, but different species of moss. Now, we can also get squamulose lichens uh, creating pincushions. So these gray pincushions here <coughs> are actually squamulose lichen. And uh, once again, they're taking over the foliose lichens. Some of these foliose lichens are target lichens that are being taken over. But again, on a site that does not have a lot of vertical crevicing, the granite's very horizontal, wind protected, free of animal traffic. Um, that's where you'll find that. So the pin cushions can either be mosses or squamulose lichens. Could, could you say what the size scale? What, what? Um, these guys here are pretty big. These are getting up to be about maybe three inches in height and maybe, you know, six inches in diameter. Um, I'm guessing, I don't know this for sure, this is just a guess, but I'm, I'm guessing, you know, something like this, you're looking at maybe, you know, 300 years of successional development to get this much pin cushion on a rock like that. Now, this is a little bit hard to see, but now this, this slide is showing crevice communities. So we're seeing a line of vegetation here, you know, a line there, a line there. So what's happening, these crevices, these vertical, you know, expansion joints in the granite, they capture mechanically weathered granite. It's, like a, it's, it's almost like the consistency of grape nut cereal. That fills these crevices with this sandy material. And the pioneer on those communities is... Um, dry-sided mosses, not pincushion mosses, but mosses like star moss, uh, things like that. They will colonize right on that sandy substrate. Then they are in turn um, colonized by fruticose lichens like reindeer lichen. So here is a, a crevice community that shows the development of these different plants here. So you'll see in the, the nose here is moss, reindeer lichen now colonizing that. Then as the community gets older, sedges and dry-sided grasses coming in, and then eventually low-bush blueberry coming in. So it's a different whole successional sequence happening in the crevices out in the bedrock. So out here, we still have crustose lichen and foliose lichen coming in, while in here, we've already got this, this crevice community developing now that's really accruing a lot of organics from all the, the vascular plants growing here. And as you can see, once this thing gro grows up out of the crevice, it starts sprawling out over the bedrock not unlike what Las Vegas was doing uh, up to about four years ago before the financial meltdown as Las Vegas was just sprawling out across the deserts. What's the role of water in that crevice? Well, again, these are very xeric plants. These are plants that can tolerate very dry sites. But once we do get into vascular plants here, like these sedges or the blueberry, now we're into plants that are no longer cryptobiotic. So they are going to have to have some amount of water to survive. But they can do it on very, very small amounts. Um, so if you get a, a, a piece of bedrock that has lots of fractures in it, you're going to get all these crevice communities growing and then sprawling out and usually merging and covering up the rock within a century's time. And it's going to take a lot longer that to ever get pin cushions. So that's the way most bedrock is colonized, by spreading and merging crevice communities on granite where you don't have a lot of, in some granites where you don't have a lot of these vertical crevices, you can then get your pin cushion communities. Again, uh, some different types of um, reindeer lichen colonizing moss in a crevice community. Um, this is my favorite species. This is uh, alpine reindeer lichen. And um, it looks sort of like heads of cauliflower, very dense. And the reason it's my favorite is when I was uh, a boy, I had an HO train set in my little Plasticville village, uh, had trees. And the trees were the alpine reindeer lichen that just had, you know, a little base glued onto them. Um, but they were painted green. Now, I still have all that stuff in my attic. And the paint probably killed the lichen. But if, let's say if the paint didn't kill the lichen, it would just still be in the cryptobiotic state. So I could actually bring it out and maybe spritz it with water and it would start functioning again. But that's why I have, you know, this, this, this love of, of alpine reindeer lichen. It reminds me of my train set when I was a boy growing up. And I think uh, Dr. Seuss must have been enamored by, by lichens. I mean, these, these fruticose lichens can take on all sorts of forms and arrangements. And there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species. And um, because a lot of his vegetation looks very lichen-like to me. Um, but these are, again, all sorts of fruticose lichens that can colonize 
the moss in the crevice community. Now, as I've mentioned um, at the start of this, often granite domes are exposed because they have a robust disturbance regime. Because the uh, bedrock is so dry and so nutrient deprived, it basically uh, um, promotes fire adapted vegetation to grow on it. So pretty much wherever you go, and you're going to find exposed granite domes in, um, let's say, the lower 48 states, you're often going to find fire adapted pines that will be there, uh, or fire adapted oaks, or fire adapted um, heaths that are in the heath family. So we're going to see that up on, on Black Mountain. We're going to see that as we start off, we're going to see that we'll have white pine, red oak, mountain laurel, not very fire adapted at all. But as we move up the mountain and it gets more austere and fire frequency increases, um, that's going to switch over to red pine, white oak, which is more fire adapted, with black huckleberry, somewhat fire adapted. And eventually, when we get up really to the top, we're in pitch pine, bear oak, low bush, blueberry, which are our three most fire adapted um, species around here. They, they, they thrive in a fire regime. Um, these fire adapted species, uh, one of the adaptations they have is they all develop very rot resistant foliage and leaf litter. So I guess this is a question. Why would it be an advantage for a fire adapted plant to lay down rot resistant litter underneath it? And that's just not rhetorical. I'll, I'll make you think a little bit. Okay, so it's fuel for fires to make not just more frequently, but make hot fires. It builds up these fuel beds. They'll make very hot fires. Because a lot of these species are not shade tolerant. They're not very strong competitors. So fire is their friend. It can remove the competition, allowing them to maintain themselves. So they're going to try to promote fire to drive out, you know, around here, things like white pine or red oak, which would overtop them and kill them off. Um, so it's usually just a matter of time before these granite domes get a fire. Now, around here in New England, they're pretty much our only sites where we can get natural lightning struck fires. We get a lot of lightning strikes around here, but they rarely cause fires because what you really need is you need a deep bed of duff that is dry, tinder dry. And you're going to get that on these granite domes because it's going to build up over centuries, build up these deep, deep duff layers so that when lightning hits, it can spark down in that duff. And you might not see a fire there for a while. It just might be smoldering and smoldering, and then all of a sudden it'll eventually surface. So it's just a matter of time before that happens. Now, in this case, this was not, this site right here was not um, burned off by a lightning strike. This is a <coughs> granite dome in the Beartooths Mountains to the north of Yellowstone. And this was actually the very northeastern extent of the 1989 Yellowstone fires that burned over a million acres. In this case, the fire came up this way, going over a granite dome that had Engelmann spruce on it, um, and burned it right down to bedrock. And actually, if you continued the dome up like this, the fire stalled right there as it was burning back down. So right over here, you get into intact forest. But this took this right down to the exposed bedrock. And now we're going to start all over from scratch again with our crustos lichens, our folios lichens, our crevice communities, everything building up. And it's going to take many, many, many centuries before you get forest back up here. Uh, but ev eventually, that forest is going to be ignited by fire and will go back down again. So it's a, a common sort of thing. Now, in a site like this, this is on um, Mount uh, Dickey in Waterville Valley, New Hampshire. This is a site that is just this granite slab here, which is about the size of a, a football field. It just has crustose lichen on it. Because every year, the snowpack builds up, the bottom metamorphoses to ice, the whole thing slides off. So every year, that ice creep, which is not really a creep, it can really get going, is just taking everything away, except for the crustose lichens that are annealed onto the bedrock. So this, this ledge here probably looks exactly what it looks like today compared to what it looked like, you know, 5,000 years ago. It just is every year being scraped clean of everything but crustose lichens. So that's another uh, disturbance that can keep these domes open. And then finally, this is the top of El Capitan in Yosemite. And we're getting an area here kept pretty clean, clean by ice creep, an area here that was hit by lightning strike that burned it off. And eventually, lightning is probably going to burn off that as well. So these sorts of disturbances will keep granite exposed um, at some point in its history. 
It'll go through the whole successional process we've talked about, uh, only to be hit by another disturbance and go through it again. So it's a very, very dynamic uh, regime. Now, um, how, how many people are actually going out in the walk? Let me just get a sign of hands. All right, so uh, I think then we'll continue with the whole slide program since about half of you are not. And what this will do is just take us on a tour from east to west through the, the various granite domes we can find in the lower 48 states of the United States. Now, when the granite landscape came out, um, I was asked uh, when I was on um, the Front Porch program on New Hampshire Public Radio, well, where are my favorite granite domes? I'd never thought about this. And uh, so I didn't have an answer, and I didn't say anything, and I could see that John Walters, who was the interviewer, is getting sort of nervous because they don't like that dead air space, you know. <laughs> he's like, he's like gesturing to me like, say something, say something. And they go, Acadia. <laughs> I mean, so I didn't know what to say. And they said, well, why? And I thought, I thought well, um, they're not, it's not the most elegant granite compared to like granite you can find in Yosemite. But because of all the fog and precipitation, it's the most species rich communities. Now, this is um, a little loop hike that goes up over Bald Peak and, and Parkman Mountain back down. The loop is like only a mile long. And yet the one time when I did it, I counted 13 different distinct changes in plant communities as I did that loop. And those changes didn't just happen once. I got probably 40 community changes within a mile. I, I don't know of any other place I've ever walked where it, the landscape changes so dramatically in terms of its ecosystems. Um, and that's because it's just so much more species rich in Acadia because of all that enrichment from the water that falls in those domes. So I guess they are probably my favorite, and it's, and it's probably the first place I would choose to venture to if I could travel anywhere, because I just, I'm, I'm just so drawn to that landscape. And again, a big factor is the amount of fog there. Now, fog is critical for lichens, not just because it gives added moisture, but fog holds about 1,000 times the amount of nutrients as rain because um, each raindrop will have sort of a you know, nuclei for the raindrop to form on, but each minute fog droplet has a nuclei. So when you get fog, you often get very enriched stuff coming in. And of course, if you're in a place like this in the oceans where you're getting some calcium coming up in, in, into the atmosphere from waves breaking and stuff, uh, that can act as a nuclei, and then all that stuff can come down. So you're not only getting the increased moisture component, you're getting a lot more nutrient on a place like uh, Acadia because of all the fog than you're going to get in Yosemite, which doesn't get fog. Uh, so that's a big, big factor. And because of that, you can get these incredible uh, you know, carpets of lichen on the bedrock. Um, this is all different species of lichen, huge patches of target lichen, which it's called target because it, when it grows you know, in its really nice form, sometimes it looks like the bullseye of a target. But... Um, each one of these bands marching out over, you know, the crustose like and gobbling it up, but just a huge array of species here. You would never see anything like this out west because, again, you just don't have the moisture or the nutrient enrichment. And also on Acadia, as you get in the forest, you find another very uh, robust lichen, lungwort. Uh, lungwort is often used as a, it's a lichen that grows in the trunks of trees, usually trees like ash or sugar maple. Um, and it's often used as an indicator of old growth forests in interior New England. Uh, but in Acadia, you can find it growing on 50 year old trees. Um, and again, because of all that moisture and enrichment that's coming in. Now, as you get up towards the summit on some of the, the, the domes in Acadia, you'll find situations like this. You're getting your crevice communities that are down hugged in below the level of the granite, and on the granite itself only crustose lichens. When you see sites like this, you're looking at sites that have always been free of other vegetation by winter ice blasting. So these are sites that are getting hit by very severe winter winds in them, ice crystals, which basically will just take anything out except the crustose lichen or anything that's not down huddled in the crevice. And the plants you'll often find in these sites huddled in the crevices are a three-toothed sink foil. Um, because they have three teeth at the end of each leaflet. You might see three teeth there. And again, just hug down in. So if you're ever up in Acadia on, near the summits and you're seeing sites that just have crustose lichen or crevices where everything can't grow above the, the level of the granite, you're looking at areas that have always been free of everything else, have always looked like that for 
ice blasting every winter. Now, this is a view of Cadillac Mountain, and actually this slide got in backwards somehow because there's so many Cadillacs there, but um, you'll see a little bit of spruce forest up in here. That is a remnant that was not burned in the 1947 fire. Uh, 1947 is often called the year that Maine burned. About 180,000 acres of uh, Maine uh, burned uh, in the second half of October that year. Uh, it had been an incredibly dry year. There was a lot of fuel on the ground left by the Hurricane of 38. Um, and when fires got into these places, they just took off. And uh, it burned off the whole summit and most of all of, uh, Mount, of Cadillac Mountain, which before the fire was called Green Mountain, uh, interestingly enough. Now, the people living up in Acadia at that time uh, predicted, or Mount Desiree at that time, predicted the demise of the National Park. They were just devastated by this fire, which burned about 11,000 acres of the park, um, little realizing that what a boon for the park it would be because it opened up hikes that had these grand views now almost throughout the entire hike, where previously you would have only find those views near the very summits that were ice blasted. Um, if you go up onto Mount Champlain today, you can find where those areas are because they're just completely covered in uh, black on black lichen. When you get up onto Champlain, you see these areas where the bedrock looks all black. Those are the areas that were open to views, and they're just little pockets up near the summit. That hike today, you can do that whole hike north to south, and you have, ex you have these exposed views the whole way. It was a 47 fire that did that. And not only that, it made a much more diverse landscape. It brought forth all these patches of birch and aspen and oak that had otherwise not been very common because you had um, all of this uh, spruce and pine forest. So what turned out to be devastating actually became a boon for that park and is one of the reasons that park has the highest visitation rates of any park today, even though it's only 50,000 acres, because it's just so much more appealing with all that diverse vegetation and these very amazing hikes that you can take over every single summit. Now, Champlain, which I just mentioned, is a great place if you want to see glacial polish on Acadia. All these areas that are shining here are all extensive areas of glacial polish. It's probably the the, the, the area that I've seen, this is on the north side of Champlain, I, it's probably the most extensive glacial polish I've seen anywhere um, in New England. So if you want to get big expanses of it, that's the place to go, the north, uh, the north ridge of Champlain Mountain. And I should mention, this all would have been forested. There would have been no viewscape here. Uh, everything you see here, pitch pine that were burned up in the fire and now have stump sprouted to come back, you know, they're only about, you know, five or six feet tall uh, because conditions are harsh and, and growth is, is slow. Yeah? If that was all forested, was it rooted in dirt? Yep. So where did the dirt go after the fire? Well, once that fire burned up everything, you know, a, a, it really burned very intently. It took out all the root systems and it all just eroded away. But the, thir the dirt that would have been there would have been really thin. Uh, you're, not, you're not talking about like soils here on glacial till where you're going to have like earth going way, way down. These would have been very, very thin soils, but it was all eroded out uh, after the fire. Now, this is pitch pine. We'll see this today on Black Mountain for people going up. Uh, it is our most fire adapted species in the Northeast and has a number of, of adaptations that, that, you know, are related to fire. The first is that I've already mentioned has this very rot resistant litter that will form these deep beds of duff to create hot fires when fire gets there. Um, secondly, it has very, very thick bark to protect its, its cambial tissue from the heat of a fire. Thirdly, it's our only uh, regional conifer that can stump sprout. If we, you know, cut a pitch pine, it will sprout back up. All of our other, you know, conifers, if we cut them below their lowest living limb, that's it for them because this has all sorts of adventitious buds underneath its bark, some belied by these needle tufts. And so if, let's say, right around here it gets girdled by heat, well, then those will become activated below and will sprout back up. Um, and then further south of here, as we get down into Long Island, the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, pitch pine have serotonous cones. And these are cones that hold viable seeds for up to over 25 years. And those cones are welded shut by resin, and they will only open if they get extremely dry. 
And that's only going to happen if you get around in the range of the pitch pine if you get generally temperatures going above 120 degrees. So they're timed to open up, the cones are timed to open up during fires because uh, the seeds of these pines are pretty small. They want to establish on a seed bed that is free of all that duff and litter. So the fire coming through and burning it up prepares the seed bed for the seeds to germinate on properly. And uh, so this, these, these serotonous cones are timed to release during fire. Now, if the fire is just a ground fire, and the temperature around the cones, let's say 140, 150 degrees, those cones will open up over a period of hours. Um, by that point, the ground fire will probably be out, and then they'll be shed. If, however, the fire gets in the canopy and the temperature starts getting up around two, 300 degrees around those cones, those cones will open up in a matter of minutes. And because you're getting such strong updrafts in a fire like that, the seeds, when they come out, do not fall. They get sucked up into the air and often get taken off, maybe traveling miles to maybe settle out in an area that was burned previously. Now, down there, you can find serotonous cones because the fire frequency in a place like the Pine Barrens is about every 20 years you're getting a fire. You know, up in Acadia, you know, the fire frequency is such you're probably not getting a fire for every, you know, few centuries or so, and serotonous cones don't make sense. So the, the pines up there do not have them. Uh, also in Acadia, it's the only place you can find where pitch pine and jack pine, their ranges overlap. And jack pine is a, another very fire-adapted tree. Um, it grows further north than pitch pine, so its southern range limits are on Acadia. The very northern range limits of pitch pine are Acadia, so they inter interface there. But the jack pine does have serotonous cones, and these are serotonous cones here that uh, will remain welded shut by resin, will only open under the heat of a fire, or this grows far enough north that temperatures where it grows can get down 50, 60 degrees below zero, and the air can be so dry, they can sometimes open in those really, really cold environments as well. Now, the jack pine is sort of like the phoenix. Um, it's pretty much its sole strategy is the serotonous cones and the rot-resistant litter. It has very thin bark. So generally, when fire gets into a jack pine stand, it's going to kill them, and they don't stump sprout. But they have all these serotonous cones, which then litter the thing with, with their seeds, and then the jack pine comes back out of the ashes in seedlings. Um, another interesting thing about Acadia is uh, a lot of the heaths that come in, and a, a heath associate that's not really a heath, black chokeberry, but we get a lot of huckleberry, blueberries, black chokeberry, they turn beautiful colors in the fall. So it's a wonderful time to be there when you get all these heaths on the bedrock turning burgundies and bright red, crimson red, and things like that. So, you know, again, these mats of, in this case, I think, black chokeberry, um, really adding brilliant colors onto the granite. So Acadia, just a, a, just a marvelous place to go, and uh, certainly a favorite destination of mine. So moving in the interior, we can get exposed granite domes in places like the White Mountains, uh, as well as over in the Adirondacks. Um, not as common as, as uh, the type of uh, summits we see in the, in the mountains there, because a lot of the summits, like in the White Mountains, are still carpeted in the original country rock. So if you open the presidentials, you're not going to see granite summits. You're going to see all this mica schist that's all broken up on the summits. But the areas that do have exposed granite, like on Chikorowa, um, Welch and Dickey, the, uh, uh, the bald faces in the White Mountains, as well as some of the mountains in um, the Adirondacks, they get very high hiker traffic. And I'm guessing the reason is, again, these exposed uh, expanses of, of this glaciated bedrock. Now, you can see a little bit of the granite here on this mountain here where you're getting these slides, but the summit actually is not <laughs> granite covered. It's covered in country rock. Now, this was a project that I got involved in on Mount Welch and Dickey back in the early 90s. Um, you hike up to this ledge here of granite uh, through a moderate, uh, basically one mile hike from the trailhead. And then when you get up onto this granite, you get your first exposed views because they ended a cliff right over here. Now this used to be a very important historic spot. It was sort of the, the major blueberry picking spot in the area. It was also a spot that Hudson River uh, school painters used to go to to paint. Uh, and there's a lot of paintings that were done at this site. And so what happened more recently is hiker traffic increased on Welch and Dickey. People would break out of the woods. 
and be attracted to that cliff and walk right across all these outcrop communities, basically annihilating them. So this, you know, and, and we were trying to do things to protect these. So people would emerge from here, just come right across them. You can see the impacts. And, you know, I like exposed granite, but I like granite that has its outcrop communities intact on it. Uh, this looks awfully beat up to me. So we eventually decided that what we're going to have to do is have hikers bring rocks up. So we just had a sign at the bottom. If you can pick up a rock or two and put it in your day pack, bring it up and drop it off up here. We have a, you know, a little hill of rocks we're building. And then the idea was we were going to line each side of the path with rocks all the way across. So once you came out in the granite, you, now you're in this, this clearly demarked trail lined with rocks. So um, Dick Fortin, who was the summit steward, uh, had enough rocks up there eventually, thought, okay, the next weekend I'm going to delineate the trail. And when he emerged in the woods, he could see the rock pile was gone. And he thought, oh my god, did someone just come up and throw all these things off the cliff? But what he found out as he walked up further is someone had taken all those rocks and outlined every single outcrop community. And it amazed him because what he saw that day, everyone walking up the granite now never stepped in those rock rings. They just stand the granite in between them, walking, having no impact anywhere, like they're walking through someone's garden. <laughs> now, it was, it, was, it was a brilliant stroke of genius, whoever did this, because what they did was they allowed people to wander wherever they wanted, but it delineated, don't step on these things. Now, the superintendent of the National Forest, the White Mountain National Forest, came up there and was aghast. He said, we are not turning our summits into Japanese tea gardens. <laughs> and he said, these rock rings have to go. And we were already documenting that, first of all, they had stabilized the erosion of, this, of the substrate because this, this ledge is sloping like this, and they're holding back now this, this, this sand. And we're also able to denote that we are getting lichen and moss colonizing that exposed sand now that people weren't walking on it. And we said, well... Go ahead, you can remove them, but we're going to demand a NEPA study, um, which you have to do before you do anything on federal lands to prove that what you're doing will not harm the ecosystem. And all of a sudden, he realized that he couldn't do that. <laughs> and so he backed away from that. So they're, they're still there today. Now, the problem is they've been so successful that now the lichen and moss are growing over them. And you can't see the distinct outline, and people are starting to walk through them again. Um, so what is going to be planned is now to put in a new zone of rock further out to clearly delineate that these are protected areas. What's that? No, it won't, it won't be done. It's just going to put the rocks up there, I guess, the way they've done last time. <laughs> because it worked so successfully. And actually, there's many summit stewards have looked at this, trying to figure out, okay, could we do this? You know, like in Acadia, they even looked at it and they said, we can't really do it in Acadia. But it, it was amazing how effectively it worked. And we later found out it was a woman and her grandson that were hiking up there, saw these impacted communities, saw the rock pile, thought they'd just take matters in their own hand. <laughs> now, where they got that idea from, I don't know, but it was really quite brilliant. Now, this is on the summit of Noonmark Mountain over in the Adirondacks. The summit is right, there's a person staying in the summit right over here. And this ledge here is about four feet tall and faces the southeast. So of course, when you're up in that mountain and it's a really cold, windy day, those winds are coming out of the northwest. So there's a lot of temptation to come over here, sit right here with your back against that ledge where you're wind protected, and you have the full sunlight coming on you. Well, this area in here used to be carpeted in black uh, crowberry, an alpine species. And um, you can almost see what's called a lichen line. Right about there, you can see the rock down here no lichen on it, the rock up here, lichen covered, that is a depth of 20 inches. So people just coming and walking on this, sitting on it, have now completely removed that intact community. And we have an area here that you can't see it all. This is just the end of it. That's about half the size of this room now. It's completely gone. Um, and so again, it's really ironic. These, these granite summits, um, you could hike an army over them. And if people just walked on the Crestos lichen covered granite and not anything else, they would not impact the summit at all. In other words, they have the ability to take the greatest hiker traffic without any impact if people just put their feet in the correct places. But once you get off the Crestos lichen covered granite, you start walking on this more fragile vegetation, you can have huge impacts. Now, a lot of these plants are geared to survive in very austere 
tough environments with strong, you know, winds and everything else, but they're not geared to, be, to, be, to being walked on. Now, one of my favorite granite domes in the White Mountains is South Bald Face. Um, it's a bit of a hike to get into the granites, but you hit this beautiful slab going up, and then you start getting uh, these areas of ledges, you know, separated by expansion joints. And if you, the trail goes up over here when I'm on, but you can get up on these terraces, and if you know how to walk on crustose lichen covered granite, you can walk across them, and it's just glorious. It's like going into this rock garden with these amazing outcrop communities. So you can just you know, walk from there to there without stepping on the crevice communities. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful landscape. You know, here's a little crevice community with mountain cranberry in it, some intact lichen, a little bit of Labrador tea. You know, there's beds of moss, again, mountain cranberry, Labrador tea. Uh, a lot of black crowberry and uh, alpine blue bilberry which the bilberry gets a beautiful foliage in the fall, can turn uh, from lavender to sort of uh, a crimson color. You know, a crevice community like this, you know people haven't walked on. To get uh, fruticose lichens like that, if they were dry, one footstep would crumble them. So just a, a wonderful place to show what intact outcrop communities on granite look like instead of all the beat up stuff we usually find uh, where people don't know how to walk on these fragile environments, but again, just staying on the granite that's crustose lichen covered, you will not leave any impact at all. Now going further west, the next domes we're going to hit, we're not going to get to until we get to the Wind Rivers in Wyoming. As I mentioned at the start, these are our tallest domes, granite domes in the country, getting up to 11,500 feet. Um, this is a place that I think rivals Yosemite in the grandeur of the domes you can find there. Uh, not as much glacial polish um, because you're in a, a more moist environment and it's been more weathered mechanically as well as by lichen, but certainly beautiful exposed granite. <clears throat> now, my favorite area to go is going into the Big Sandy Trailhead, which is the most distant trailhead to get into, and hiking up into the um, Clear Lake, Deep Lake District. This granite wall here is rising 2,500 feet, so that's, that's certainly rivaling the valley walls in Yosemite. Um, and this is a braided stream coming down. There's a section further up where the stream parts, and in the spring, of course, floods the whole slab of granite, but it parts so that in the summertime, you have an area that's almost the size of a football field that is clean of any vegetation at all, not even a crustose lichen up, because it's all taken out by the spring freshets. And um, I, was the, I, I, I was so enthralled to find that that, of course, after lunch, I took a nap on it, which is a big mistake because... You don't take naps in the Rockies in the summertime because they generate a lot of thunderstorms. <laughs> and so when I woke up, I, you know, I saw that, wow, I got to get up on this dome if I want to catalog it with photographs and I want to journal what's up there, I'd better get going. Because uh, when I woke up, it was looking like this, and I thought, I, I got to get up in the dome top. So I started hiking up, um, looked back across the way at this beautiful granite wall. You'll notice it looks different up here than here. This was all above the glacial ice. Um, it would have been sort of a, a, a refuge, a refugia for like um, alpine species during the last glaciation. But this all undercut by glacial ice and scoured off um, as you know a valley glacier came through there. But anyways, working my way up past these uh, tree islands of uh, subalpine fir and getting these little pocket communities, which were really stunning to me because I'd forgotten um, about, you know, sort of um, the amount of wildflowers you can get in certain sites out west. I was, but I was still surprised to find on granite, but this was just a beautiful little wildflower garden because the soils were deep enough here to really hold moisture. But again, getting up towards the top of the dome quickly as I could to try to get some photographs and quickly record what was there. And um, this is actually the, the photo from the cover of the book. I took this, and about 20 seconds later, lightning peeled all across that ridge there. And, and within about two more minutes later, the wind had come up, and I was starting to get pelted with uh, hail and rain. So I quickly ran down in the call down here and huddled, huddled under some limber pines uh, to wait out the storm. Now, if I'd been John Muir, I would have stayed up there, but <laughs> I'm not. So <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. Um, 
And then I went further north in the Wind Rivers um, into the Seneca Lake District. This is lower elevation than there. The domes are not quite as grand. It's drier, much more fire prone. This whole area was burned off um, previous to my coming there. And, uh, you know, again, examples of heat killed uh, lodgepole pines from the fires. Not as much of a wildflower bloom as lower elevation, not quite as moist. So some alpine yarrow and goldenrod. And then from there, I moved north into the um, Beartooth Mountains of Montana. Now, they're vegetatively almost identical, but the Beartooths get much more snow. So you didn't see much snow in the last slide set. Um, I was in the Beartooth just a week after the Wind River, same elevation, actually lower, uh, up here about 10,500 feet, but extensive snow beds. Um, and that affects a much, that creates a much more opulent alpine bloom up here in these granite domes. So the dome's sort of gentle, not, not as uh, big as the ones in the Wind Rivers, a lot of snow surrounding them. Um, still nice granite. And really wonderful wildflowers. So here, huge mats of the pink mountain heather. Uh, I could find mats about the size of this room of this stuff being bathed by uh, snowbank communities melting into it. Um, one of my favorite flowers, the few-flowered shooting star. Um, very elegant flower. This has an endemic bumblebee that pollinates it. And the bumblebee collects pollen because this doesn't have much nectar. So the way it works is the bumblebee hovers underneath the flower and the frequency of its wing beat just causes the pollen to fall off onto its back. So it just hovers there, the pollen falls off, then it goes on. And of course, every once in a while, it's t hitting the tip of the flower and, and creating cross-pollination. Um, succulents like the king's crown can occur there. This amazed me. This is the big-rooted spring beauty, and this was in a very small crevice community. And again, I, I wouldn't have expected <coughs> it, but um, up above, uh, water is trickling down across the granite and coming down this crevice and sort of irrigating it. And it's a bad shot of it, but the elephant head, which has a flower that looks very much like an elephant, again, pollinated by a different species of uh, alpine bumblebee. And then lots of this calaplaca lichen called jewel lichen. And um, jewel lichen needs a lot of nitrogen. And so when you see it on rocks like this out in the Rockies, you're, you're looking at probably a sentinel post of a pica. Um, pikas are small members of the rabbit family that um, cut sedges and have these you know, hay mounds that they have down in, in uh, sort of cavities between, between boulders. And they're very territorial and very protective because they try to raid each other's hay piles. So they're often, if they're not storing hay, they're up in their sentinel post making sure another pika doesn't come in. Of course, they're urinating the rock and then these calaplaca communities form. So you can actually pick out lichen posts in the distance, and it makes it very easy to get photographs of pikas because you have to go up and sit by one, and the pika eventually is going to emerge. Um, and so I did that and got uh, a picture of the pika there coming out. The sentinel post is over here, and that's the pika there. It looks sort of like a rock, but you might see a little bit of the ear there. Yeah. Now, I never experienced any wind when I was there, but obviously winter wind's a big factor all these limber pines tucked down below the top of the granite from winter ice blasting. And now we're starting to get into trees that really have a lot of age on them, even though they're not very big. Because in a site like this, they're going to be very, very slow growing. So moving further west, I went into the Stewart Range in the North Cascades, and this was the most austere of the domes I had found. Um, I call it the land of contrast, because everything was black or white, rounded, or just incredibly jagged. Um, this place um, is called the Enchantment Basin. It's probably the most popular hiking and climbing spot in the Northern Cascades. So you can only get in with a permit system. They only allow, when I, the year that I was there, 1999, only about 20% of the people applying for permits got in. I was lucky. I got my permit. I got it for the days I wanted. So I really lucked out. Um, it was also the year that Mount Baker broke the all-time record for snowpack. So now we're in early August. This is only about uh, 7,000 feet, 
and the snow was just beginning to melt out up there. Um, so a very, very dramatic place, but very species poor, not much growing there. Um, so again, a lot of white and a lot of dark uh, areas where the snow cover melts out late. The ground is completely exposed, no lichen growth or anything on it. Uh, areas where wind keeps the snow from accumulating. You, it's really black because it's covered with this moss that's a cryptobiotic moss called Funaria that basically looks like black velvet that just covers the granite. So you can tell where the granite's been covered by snow because it's free of any vegetation areas where it's kept free by uh, winter winds of snow. And that's sort of a close-up of Funaria, although it's hard to see. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty austere place. But beautiful um, tarns. Tarns are uh, lakes that are carved in, uh, by glaciers carving the granite bedrock. This was Lake Vivian. Uh, getting into this is really a challenge because the trail comes up over here, and you can't get around this side of the lake because it quickly becomes vertical cliff. So you have to come around this side, but the whole enchantment basin is draining out of there into a waterfall that falls vertically 300 feet. And to get over that channel, which is rushing, there's a log that's about 18 <laughs> inches in diameter. And you think, if I slip and go over, I'm going in that really rapid flow. And then only about 10 feet later, I'm going down. So luckily, we had climbing ropes. And we you know, um, you know, sort of tied up and went across in that fashion. Because everyone else was not going across and was camping over in here. And we actually got in because we had climbing ropes. So people who went up to hike were sort of stuck where the people who are going up to climb were, were better off. But um, these beautiful tarns interlace in this valley, Lake Vivian, uh, Lake Leprechaun, there's a bunch of other lakes, just make it quite magical. Yep, going backwards there. Now, these were the only flowering plants I could find were these heaths, the, the pink mountain heather, the yellow mountain heather, and the cassiope or moss plant, or also called bell mountain heather. This plant has the smallest leaves of any woody plant we can find. Now, these leaves up here are, you know, a little bit bigger than rice grains. The leaves down here are about the quarter of the length of a rice grain. So when these are not in bloom, you'd be really hard-pressed to, to be, think you were looking at a vascular plant. You think you're looking at a very delicate moss, but then they come out with these beautiful bells that just makes them really, I think, probably my favorite member of that family. But those are the only things in bloom I could find. Um, and here's a bed of the, the, the Bell Mountain Heather with some yellow and pink mixed in, but nothing else. Um, and the reason is mountain goats. When we went into the Enchantment Basin, we were told only urinate on the granite. Don't urinate in the soil, don't urinate on plants, because the mountain goats will go and eat that stuff. So only urinate in the granite. Now, I found this a little bit hard to believe. Um, but I was, I was a good boy. I only urinated on the granite. Um, so. Here's the mountain goats that are the cause of this. And what's happened is they've habituated to people. They're very salt deprived. And so they've habituated to people, uh, hanging around where people hang around to lick up and eat the urine and things like that where they can get some of the salts. Um, so um, the first mountain goats I encountered was right in the spot. I hadn't seen mountain goats the whole day. I peed right there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, within a minute, I heard the clattering of hooves. <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, what do they have, a sentinel with a you know, spotting scope that's watching people? I, I couldn't believe it. So I'm actually sitting right here with these mountain goats running up. They're butting each other, licking the urine. and think, wow, it really happens. You know, they're really after that urine. And while I'm ta foot taking photographs, I felt this warm, raspy thing go up the back of my neck. And I jumped. And it was two uh, little youngins, two kids, uh, mountain goats, that were just licking my neck for the salt. Um, <laughs> Now, it was sad because these animals were very malnourished. They're hanging out in this basin as people are there. They've denuded the vegetation. Um, this year must have been very hard for them because it was this huge winter with a huge snowpack. There's not much to eat, and they did not look in good shape. Um, you know, I felt very bad for them. They looked malnourished, and they did not look good. But uh, that was the reason for doing this permitting system. They're trying to keep fewer people in there so that the goats will sort of get out of there, and their population will decrease and, and get that system back into balance of some sort. Yeah. 
So what's wrong with the goats in there from elsewhere? I mean, is this because people are there? Or are it they, is. Or they've been pushed out of other areas? By no, other they're really concentrating there because this was so heavily trafficked by people. It was just such a popular place to go hiking and climbing. The density of people was so high that the goats were just clustering in there. And the rangers are allowed to put salt blocks out other places to give them the salt that they, they, they want. That's a good, you know, they, I didn't even think of that. And what an interesting idea. Yeah, maybe get the salt blocks out so they're out of there and somewhere else. That's a really interesting idea. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't even think of that and I never even asked that question. Um, again, we're getting some really amazing wind-stunted trees here. Now, we're getting over into white bark pine territory, replacing limber pine. Um, dramatically stunted bonsai trees from winter winds. Um, and this probably my favorite. This tree looked like a big toadstool. Um, the trunk about three feet across and only growing to a height of about five feet. It must have been ancient. You know, I asked, uh, I had no idea how to age something like this. So I asked, you know, someone I got down, what do you think? And they said, well, gee, I don't know, but, you know, maybe a thousand years. I mean, just, but, you know, probably very, very old. Um, but again, wind stunted quite dramatic. And then also in there were these amazing uh, alpine larch. Um, these were the only trees that could grow up vertically because in the winter they shed all their needles and they don't get the effects of ice blasting. Um, and they have very spindly shapes. You can pick them out from the, from the subalpine fir that grows very erect. The things that are spindly are all these subalpine larch, again, looking like something out of Dr. Seuss, like, you know, Charlie Brown's Christmas tree maybe also. Um, but they could grow right up. So any tree you saw growing up out of the granite, these were the, the alpine larch. Um, I, were told, I was told that these were quite ancient. Uh, a two-foot diameter tree like this would probably be about 1,500 years. Now, what was interesting, the north side of these domes, this was August 7th, they were just breaking leaf. And yet leaf fall is the first week in October. So here, you know, they're only going to have leaves on them for less than two months. Again, giving you some idea of why they are so slow growing. So then I ended up in Yosemite, and this is really the granddaddy of the domes, if you like, if you like domes. This is where you're going to find your biggest domes. You're going to find the most of them. Um, this is over the, the Tanea Lake area. Uh, that's polydome there. Uh, but just, you know, if you really like striding across a lot of granite, this is the place to go. And um, when I came in, I came into the meadows um, of Yosemite coming up from Mono Lake, and I was, I was meeting some friends there, and they wanted to hike domes right away, and it, it looked almost, sur you know, surreal. You're in this, 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 you know, high, you know, meadow zone, and then these, you know, these granite domes emerging right out of them, almost looking like monuments that were put there or something. Um, they just look so out of place, but again, very, very striking. So we went up uh, Lembert Dome, which was one of these ones coming out of the meadows, and uh, we just started hiking right up, um, you know, within an hour of my getting there. And then I started to realize that, gee, I hadn't thought about this much. Going up didn't seem so difficult, but then when I looked at what we'd have to do to go back down, I thought, golly, if I lose traction here, I'm going to be in real trouble. <laughs> I'm just going to start rolling down this thing. Um, we did make it down, and my friends were confident in their traction. They walked down, but I sort of crab walked it down. I just wasn't, I just was down on, you know, my feet and my hands thinking, I'm going to stay low to the rock and I get more traction this way. Because I just didn't trust myself. I thought I'd lose it. So since we didn't want to go in the valley, that would have been pretty hectic at that time of year, because this is now mid-August, really peak time. Uh, we went down into um, the drainage that leads down to Hetch Hetchy. And uh, this is, you know, um, was a wonderful place to go because there were very few people there. And I could still get up <laughs> on the dome tops on either side and really have, you know, pretty much those sites to myself. So um, we hiked down from Glen Allen probably about four miles and uh, camped right near this little waterfall. And we didn't see a, a person the whole four days that we were there. Not, not one person. I'm sure people hiked through, but we were probably off on the dome tops at that point. But we did have a pine marten that visited us every day. There was a log just upstream that crossed the stream, and that pine marten would go back and forth across that log. Uh, but it was just a wonderful time to be there in this very heavily visited park at a very heavily visited time of year and just not really see many people. But I'd spend my days up on dome tops like this. Um, and this would be the view from that area looking over the cathedral spines and across other domes. 
and extensive floors of glacial polish you could just walk on for miles. And uh, beautiful little you know, crevice communities. This is an endemic uh, areogonum, a type of buckwheat, uh, endemic to um, Yosemite. Beautiful uh, crevice communities of uh, stone crop, the lance leaf stone crop that was not in bloom. And then um, huge uh, western junipers. Um, you know, in my field guide, they're saying western juniper could get up to five feet. This tree was seven and a half feet in diameter, and I, I didn't know they got that big. Big basal fire scars on them, green leaf manzanita, another fire adapted species. So this is around 9,000 feet in elevation. You're starting to see very fire prone vegetation showing that fire is a prominent factor here. Um, and uh, up about 10 feet up, getting the snow like in Lotharia, which will only grow above the permanent snowpack, indicating that you know, snowpack here is about 10 feet thick uh, in the wintertime. And that's a close-up of the Lotharia, also known as snow lichen. And then some just amazingly old western junipers. When you start getting up in the dome tops, you know, these things contorted and, and dramatic. Um, this one here, uh, about six feet in diameter and probably only about, you know, 30, 35 feet in height. Must, you know, been ancient, ancient tree. Um, and that is my wife, Marcia, next to it, giving sort of an idea of size. But this was probably the most striking one I'd seen. This, again, six feet across, standing no more than maybe 10 feet in height. Uh, I asked a park ranger about that. He said, oh, western juniper like that would probably be up around 2,500 years. So, you know, really ancient, ancient beings that have withstood very, very tough conditions for, for millennia. <coughs> So, so yeah. trees and the larch and the other trees, have they ever taken a boring to I'm, I'm sure they have. That's why, I mean, I have never cored them or anything, but I'm sure they have. So that's why he said, yeah, I'm guessing about 2,500 years. Um, but really, just uh, such a compelling landscape. Again, miles you can just wander across without having really to watch your feet because it's all smooth and there's not much, you know, vegetation on it. Um, just a dramatic place to go. And I think that's the end of the slide program. <laughs> so I, uh, I think we have time for questions, if there are any. Yeah. I have one about Mount Mansfield. What is the nose? What would you consider that to be? Is it a dome? It's, well, it's actually, it's like a Roche Moutonne. So, um, and I'm trying to remember, I haven't been up on Mansfield in a while to know what rock it is. I don't think it's granite. No, it's not yeah. granite. Yeah. All metamorphic rocks that far north of the Mountains. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What's the time frame between the formation of the Appalachian Mountains and the Appalachian Rockies? And they formed quite different things. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the Appalachians are m related to the Acadian orogeny event, which is back, you know, 360 to maybe 400 million years ago. The Rockies, much more recent, only about 70 million years ago. So the Rockies, quite a bit younger. That's why they're bigger and, you know, taller. Well, they were well. well, no, it was, it was a tectonic event, but you're going to get, you know, when you're getting, you know, two plates colliding, you're going to get a lot of folding of rock. So, you know. So, pitch my, I don't know, how did pitch my get here today? Not our, uh, it's not north of the range, it's south of the range. Yeah, we're, we're the well, you know, um, <clears throat> about 6,000 years ago, we were in the Hipsy Thermal. Okay. That was the warmest part of this current interglacial regime we're in. And so southerly species were much more well distributed up here. That's why, you know, like black gum we have up here near the range limits, mountain laurel near its range limits pitch pine near its range limits. And then, you know, over the last 5,000 years, really until just very recently, we we're in a cooling trend. And so ranges pull back, leaving like little remnant populations. Um, so what we find on, you know, you know up on um, Black Mountain, over on Wontasticate, over on Pisgah Mountain, um, a little bit up on Fall Mountain, these are like little remnant populations when pitch pine was much more common up here. 
Yeah. Uh, you think of granite as being very resistant, but I've seen patches in Maine and the White Mountains where it just crumbles. Yeah. What's going on there? Well, you're getting, you know, you can get these granites that are very coarse grained and um, you're, you can get them on sites where you can get a lot of expansion and contraction. And what happens is the mineral grains expand and contract at different rates and they can start leveraging themselves right apart and they can just sort of crumble down. Um, so you can find sites like that where the granite's a lot weaker and does just weather into, yeah, it just does. There's a great site like that up on Mount Welch and Dickey, Mount Welch in Waterville Valley. Just, it's amazing. It just changes and the granite's much more coarser grain just is crumbling apart. in New England northern forests that grow as big as the one you saw, we saw in the... Um... Um, we can. I've, there's, um, there's some larch I've seen in the Adirondacks that are getting bigger than that tree there. You know, up, I've, up there getting up around 30 inches in diameter. And I've heard that, you know, on some of the muskeg up in Maine you can get some big larch. I haven't seen them, but I've heard that. Yeah. Can you show us pictures of the dome, the granite domes, with the granite glacial boulders right on them. Would they have um, broken off from nearby granite areas? Obviously not from a dome, but mm -hmm. what's the source of Yeah, and they, they probably did break off sort of close by, you know, within, you know, a couple miles. I mean, maybe 10 miles, maybe 20, but yes, they would have been carried there. Because generally, you know, if you're, if you're in a, a glacier, 100, 200 miles, you know, you're going to be down to just, like I said, grand. I mean, sand. You're, you're, you're going to be ground right up. All right. Well, very good. Thank you very much.